This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice as we lift his name. This is the day that the Lord has made. Come and rejoice. We will rejoice and be glad in well, good morning, church family, and blessings to you. Hey, just want to bring you a few quick announcements from South Dakota this morning. Uh, first of all, there will be a clipboard going around this morning getting volunteers for the outreach program that I mentioned last week. Uh, so if you're interested in that, I would uh, encourage you to <laughs> please put your name on that list. Make sure it gets passed all the way around. Uh, also, if you weren't here last week and need to get your name, uh, signed up for the fish fry. Uh, please do that. That clipboard will be going around as well. Uh, as a reminder, the fish, fish fry is coming up on the 29th. That'll be a fifth Sunday worship Sunday uh, with uh, the potluck fish fry following service. Well, family, uh, miss you guys this morning. Uh, pray for us uh, for safety in our hunts, for fruitful hunts uh, in our travels, uh, and blessings to you. We'll see you next week. This for short, guys. Good thing we got a little flexibility here. Okay, all right. Okay. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust, who does not turn to the proud, to those who go astray after a lie. Let's bow for a word of prayer, please. Dear Gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning uh, with many thanks for all the things you do for us and your careful watch over us each day for your gift of salvation. And at this time of the year, we're thankful for a, a plenty harvest that you have provided for us. Uh, we want to pray for those, each and every one on our prayer list this morning. Uh, and also, we want to remember the men that are on the, the hunting trip, especially. We pray for a good time and safety there. Uh, also, for any unspoken requests that there might be this morning, I'm sure there are probably several. So uh, you know what they are, Lord, and we just pray for an answer in each and every one. Uh, the other thing we want to pray for this morning is those in Israel uh, who have lost loved ones. We pray for peace and comfort for them. We also pray for uh, protection for uh, Israel, your chosen people, as they, as they fight the evil that confronts them there. Uh, we now pray for Kerry as he brings us a message from your word this morning that you would bless us with his message. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's appreciate Rick praying for um, Israel. Um, the reason, another, I guess to clarify, the reason we should be praying for them, Paul spent some time in Romans um, talking about Israel, believing Israel being the root, and we are the branches. We Gentiles, which I think is everybody in this room, are grafted into that. If some, he says, if some of the branches having been broken off, and you, though a wild, wild olive shoot, have been grafted in among others, and now share in the nourishing sap from the olive root, do not boast over those branches. Um, he says, uh, branches were broken off so that I could be grafted in, granted, but they were broken off because of unbelief, and you stand by faith. And we are grafted into that very rich heritage, right? And we're told in Psalm 122, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May those who love you be secure. May there be peace within your walls and security within your citadels. 
We are commanded to pray so. To the one we are grafted into. <clears throat> so we're going to sing a little bit about the grafting here. Which was made possible because of what Jesus did. the throne 
Well, good morning. I hope that you've had a good start to the day. You opened up with prayer this morning when you rolled out of the rack. Um, I know that's hard to, to do sometimes. Um, things just don't quite start out like you'd like for them to do. But I can guarantee you if you make that a habit, it's a great start for the day. Um, my name is Kerry Goodrich, and Pastor Ben has asked me to step in for him today. It's been an interesting couple of weeks, um, a lot of time. Uh, you've heard Pastor Ben talk about Satan kind of sticking the screws to you every opportunity he gets. And it's been interesting because I started this, eh, I'm going to say six weeks ago, and it seemed like every time I'd get it started, God would say, hey, yeah, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, finally here about 10 days ago, he said, okay, he said, I got a direction for you. So... I started, and um, I ended up with 10 pages of notes, and he said, uh-uh, not going to work. So we kept narrowing it down and narrowing it down, and um, I'm trying to figure out how to make this into a sermon or a message on community, fellowship relations within the, the, the family here, the family with outside the church, and um, I'm really struggling with it because everything I see here is set up for uh, the Jewish community, the Old Testament, and um, it de it's dealing today with mixed message or mixed marriages, um, not supporting the Sabbath, and not supporting the temple. Um, and, and you can make that work for today. So I'm working it down, and I'm working it down, and I'm down to about 35 minutes, and then I read it to Robin. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, mm, yeah, it doesn't sound right. So uh, we spent the last uh, three days working on this, and, and I'm extremely thankful for Robin. 
um, it's always good to have a wife that prays with you and uh, isn't afraid to say, yeah, this, this doesn't work. So to you that are married, that you have a spouse that will work with you, praise the Lord. So we're going to start with um, a little bit of Pastor Ben's background last week, and it was on prayer uh, and how and why we should spend as much time with God as possible. Um, some of those um, answers that he had given was because God is always present. He always knows what we're looking for. Um, he, he just, he's there with us 100% of the time. Every time we turn around, if we're, uh, if we're looking, we'll walk into him. God has complete knowledge of everything. There is nothing that God does not know about you, any of you. Me standing up here today, shaking in my shoes, he's quite aware of that. Um, he's capable to do anything that consists with his desires and God's way. Is, um, he always understands what is best for us. So that's kind of why I started out where I did today, is don't be afraid to get up and ask him. If you get up and you've lost sleep the night before, having trouble at work, start out with a prayer with God right off of the bat. Uh, you'll see today as I continue here that uh, this has got what got uh, the action, uh, the movement within Israel is the, the reading of the word. Something else that struck me that Pastor Ben talked about last week um, was the difference um, between praising God for what he's given you and praising God simply for who he is. Um, I had to chew on that a little bit, to be honest with you. If, if you sit back and you look at it, um, and most of my prayers are thank you for, whether it's the sunrise, um, it's the enjoyment of being out in God's creation, and which is where I work most of my life. But it's, it's, it's tweaking that just a little bit to put God back into control. Um, it's, it's, it's saying, you know, take the reins. Um, I'm going to follow you no matter where you lead me. And, and I, like I said, I had to chew on that and work that out just a little bit. And I'm still not 100% sure that I'm where I need to be, but God will put me there in his time. Which leads to the last point that I kind of went across with uh, Pastor Ben's message, and it's no matter what lays ahead for us, the question should be, what is it that you want me to learn in this situation? Or possibly, Lord, how can I most glorify you in this situation? Um, and, and I like that. I don't think I need to add anything else to that. It's pretty self-explanatory. Um, but then he got my attention because he said, pray about it, turn it over to God, listen, and then be patient. I don't know about the rest of you, but I'm not very good at patience. Um, I kind of struggle with it. Um, it's kind of like what I shared with you at the beginning of this story, um, the message is, you know, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm walking out here, and I'm waiting, and I'm waiting, and I've got my finger, we're drumming up here now, you know, it's like, come on, I'm waiting. Um, so patience are not one of the things that I am extremely good at. Um, he's teaching me that. Um, I'm 65 and still learning. <laughs> um, so for today, um, I'm going to be reading out of, um, the, main, the main is going to be out of the latter part of Nehemiah, chapter 938 through uh, Nehemiah chapter 10. I've titled it, Returning to God's Covenant, Unity Within the Community. But prior to jumping into God's word, let's take a quick look at the focus verse. I'm going to say it, and then if you all want to grab the uh, handout, the pamphlet, uh, we'll read it together once. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a, spirit, renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with your generous spirit. Now, if you'd all share with me, we'll say it one more time. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with your generous spirit. Psalms 51, verse 10, 11, and 12. Thank you. The goal of this confession that David is making here is not self-abasement, or I don't see it as self-abasement anyway. He's looking for a renewal of the joy and gladness that the faithful have in God's presence. And I like that. Um, I like the joy that comes with knowing Christ as Savior. 
It's the same thing that Israel is seeking today, minus the, the Savior through Jesus Christ. That hasn't happened yet, but they're looking to back into the covenant with God so that they can receive his blessings. I'll take a minute to pray here, and I'll read through chapter 10, and we'll take a stab at it. Father and God, I come before you today. I thank you for those who've chosen on this day of the Sabbath to come in to touch base with the relationships that they have in this church. To encourage one another, I ask that you would bless us, that the whole Holy Spirit would be active today within myself as I do this message and within the, those sitting in the pews, that you would encourage all of us and give them something to chew on this week, God, as, as they think about the message. Um, day by day, we are the temple. In Christ's name I pray, amen. I'm going to jump back into chapter 8 because where God has led me this week has not been specifically in chapter 10, but as we think about the relationships that are built um, within the church or within the Jewish community, I have to go back that far because it starts with um, chapter 8, 1, and it reads, And all of the people gathered as one man into the square before the water gate. And they told Ezra, the scribe, to bring the book of law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded Israel. Something that struck me when I read this, as I thought about this, is this didn't come from Ezra or Nehemiah or from the Levites. This came from the people. And if you know the history, the people didn't have a whole lot of say in this. So if you think about this just a little bit, you can see the hand of God in this. Um, again, he's, he's taken the weak, he's taken the helpless, and he started this ball rolling out here. Um, so you see, the Spirit of God was at work even before the reading of, the God's, of God's Word. Over the next three chapters, you'll see that God's steadfast love for his people uh, carries through the next three chapters. And in Nehemiah 8, 9, midway through this verse, it reads, For all the people wept as they heard the words of the law. So you've got Ezra reading now, and it has a deep effect on everybody that's standing out there. And it's interesting because... As I did a little history on this, it sounds like there could have been 90,000 people standing here listening to these folks. And um, so the word of God was doing its intended work. They are being convicted of their sin. They are becoming one body under God again. Chapters 9, 1, and 2, you'll see now on the 24th day of the month, the people of Israel were assembled with fasting and sackcloth and with earth upon their heads. And the Israelites separated themselves from all foreigners and stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their father. This is true movement at this point. You see a change in the heart and you see a humbling of their spirit. In uh, chapter 9, 32 through 37, the Israelites are pleading with God for intervention. In 33, it caught my attention where they just plain say, God, you are just in all that has befallen of us. This is what real confession looks like. It recognizes that God is right, we are wrong. Confession is agreeing, agreeing with God about these two things. The Israelites have been convicted because they have heard the word of God from the man of God or a man of God. Hebrews 4.12 states, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing the division of the soul and spirit of joints and of marrow and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. As I floated through chapters 8, 9, and 10, these thoughts kept rattling around in my head. Look up, look back, and look ahead. Look up, for me, is before I start anything, I should pray over it and I should be patient and I should wait for God's answer. Look back, why am I in the position that I'm in? Have I went astray? And then think how faithful and how patient God has been waiting on me to return. I thank you for that. Look ahead. What doors do I need to close and others that I need to reopen to receive the blessings God has promised? Nehemiah 9.38 starts the work of the covenant. Because of all this, we make a firm covenant in writing. On the sealed document are the names of our princes, our Levites, and our priests. They have come to a place of decision here. 
They have broken hearts. They know God's goodness. They've accepted their responsibilities for their sinfulness, and they are now looking to a renewal of obedience. So at this point, I'm going to jump into chapter 10, and I got to tell you, in the first 27 verses, folks, there are 84 names, and of those 84 names, I can pronounce maybe 15 of them. <laughs> so if you don't mind, I'm going to skip the first 27 pages, but know that these are the priests, these are the uh, Levites, and these are the civic leaders that have signed this. So I'm going to start reading with the obligations of the covenant 28. The rest of the people, the priests, the Levites, the gatekeepers, the singers, the temple servants, and all who have separated themselves from the peoples of the land to the law of God, their wives, their sons, their daughters, all who have knowledge and understanding with their brothers, their nobles, and enter into a curse and an oath to walk in God's law that was given by Moses, the servant of God and to observe and do all the commandments of the Lord, our Lord, and his rules and his statutes. We will not give our daughters to the peoples of the land or take their daughters as or for our sons. And if the peoples of the land bring in goods or any grain on the Sabbath day to sell, we will not buy from them on the Sabbath or on a holy day. And we will forego the crops of the seventh year and the exaction of every debt. We also take on ourselves the obligation to give yearly one-third part of a shekel for the service of the house of our Lord, for the showbread, the regular grain offering, the regular burnt offering, the Sabbaths, the new moons, the appointed feasts, the holy things, and the sin offering to make atonement for Israel and for all the work of the house of our God. We the princes, or we the priests, the Levites, and the people have likewise cast lots for the wood offering to bring into the house of our God according to our father's houses at the appointed time, year by year, to burn on the altar of the Lord our God. As it is written in the law, we obligate ourselves to bring the first fruits of our ground and the first fruits of all fruit of every tree year by year to the house of the Lord. Also to bring to the house of our God to the priests who minister in the house of our God, the firstborn of our sons and of our cattle, as it is written in the law, and the firstborn of the herds and of our flocks, and to bring the first of our dough and our con contributions, the fruit of every tree, the wine and the oil, to the press, to the priests, to the chambers of the house of our God, and to bring to the Levites the tithe from our ground, to uh, for it is the Levites who collect the tithes in all our towns where we labor. And the priest, the son of Aaron, shall be with the Levites when the Levites receive the tithes. And the Levites shall bring up the tithes of the tithes to the house of our God, to the chambers of our storehouse. For the people of Israel and the sons of Levi shall bring the contribution of grain, wine, and oil to the chambers where the vessels of the sanctuary are, as well as the priests who minister and the gatekeepers and the singers, we will not neglect the house of our God. Thank you, God, for your word and for what it represents. So in this covenant, you have all of these names the civic leaders, the entire Jewish community who had knowledge and understanding. They're taking action at this point. They, showed the they are showing their change of heart. This covenant was signed publicly and was witnessed by all. The public covenant meant accountability to each one of these folks that signed it as well as to those that were listening and agreed to it. To show their seriousness, there's both an oath, I promise to follow this covenant, and a curse. If I fail, punish me so that I may return to you. Now it's kind of my own saying. That's just the way I looked at it to begin with. And I thought, wow, if I were to sign a covenant, write it out, and I made this promise, if I do not follow this, punish me. There are weeks, folks, that I'm afraid I'd be black and blue. I don't know how well that would go with the rest of you. But, but I thought about it for a while, 
And you know, I'm going to put a twist on this. He said, Lord, whatever it takes, I want to follow you. I like that better because at that point I put it back into God's hands. It's God's leadership and my fellowship with God. And we go back to look up, look back, and look ahead. And standing on that ground, I'm letting God lead me wherever he wants me to go. If that means I'm standing up here, I'm standing up here. Uh, if it means I'm working out in the park as a volunteer, I'm working as a volunteer. Um, so that's just the way that I ended up looking at this. I like it a lot better when I put it in God's hands rather than mine. As we continue on down with the covenant, we're, we're dealing or they're dealing with the marriage issue. And I think the reason that they put this in here first is because this is something that they've recently struggled with. And Nehemiah told them, take your wives back. Uh, this isn't going to work. And it caused a lot of problems within it. So um, I, I think that that's, that's the issue is with, with, with um, this is, is why it started right up front here. Second Corinthians 6.14 states, do not be unequally, unequally yoked with unbelievers for what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness or what fellowship has light with darkness? How often have we witnessed a believer marrying an unbeliever thinking they will turn them to Christ only to have the believer leave the faith? Have you ever thought of the marriage vows or the marriage as being a covenant? It's done in public. Your vows are done in public. They're done to one another, so you're held accountable to one another as well as to those that are there. Um, uh, Malachi 2.14 states, uh, yet she is your companion and your wife by covenant. And I thought the two becoming one, and now we have one new unity. The second item on this covenant that they're dealing with is the agreement the Sabbath will be the day to spend with the Lord and with other believers. And you have to keep in mind that they haven't kept this for a long time. They have not supported the Sabbath at all. They've worked through it. They've traded. They've sold. Um, and God's finally got their attention. And this is going to cause a little bit of problems because you've got to remember, these folks are they're under bondage. They don't own this land anymore. So the tribute is unbelievable that they have to turn back to the king. So they're giving up a day um, relying on God to provide for them. And then you've got the Sabbath of every seven years where they don't raise anything for it'd be a year and a half before they take the crops off. And then you've got the 49th and the 50th year, which is a Sabbath plus the year of Jubilee. So now you've got two and a half years that they are not going to have any crops. And they're still responsible for taking care of their families, their livestock, and uh, giving the tribute to the king. So this is, this is a, pretty, a pretty hard thing that they, uh, they've committed to do. And which, again, just takes them back to the original commandments that God had given them. But uh, it's good to see that they are at a spot where they're willing to say, I, we're going to do this. So that's, um, it's just one of those things that when you do a covenant, uh, you want to think it clear through before you do it. So I thought of this. Um, as we think of a Sabbath, what do you think of the Sabbath at Baruch? What, what, does qual what qualifies as a Sabbath here? I think most of you would probably say Sunday. Romans 14, 5 and 6. One man esteems one day above another. Another esteems every day alike. Let each be fully convict, convinced in his own mind. And I hope I haven't taken this out of text with the scripture. But it seems to me that a lot of times we tell somebody when they should be here or when they should be there. And it tends to ruffle some feathers. Some think I just have to be at church on Sunday. Others think, wow, man, you should, you know, you should spend a lot more time in church than what you do. My thought as a believer in Christ is I believe that the Holy Spirit lives within me. My body is the temple, and I have no excuse for not spending time with God every day. It kind of goes back to what I had shared. You get up in the morning, you talk to God. Um, you're driving to work. Give him thanks for the, sun, for the sunrise. Um, 
maybe it might be something as serious as somebody just crossed the line while they were texting. Take the time to say thank you for protection, provision. Thank God for your job, for your shelter. Um, this goes on 24-7 with me. Sometimes God gets me up in the middle of the night. We spend a little time before I go back to sleep. Um, so it's, it's just a thought of how I look at the Sabbath. Uh, you have to make up your own mind what you consider the Sabbath and when you want to celebrate it. The last promise of this covenant, we will be faithful to God when it comes to supporting God's work. This is pretty simple because they went back into Deuteronomy and they just simply said, we're going to give you our firstborn. We're going to give you the first fruits. We're going to start tithing again and we're going to give grain offerings and we are not going to neglect the house of the Lord. So if they're not neglecting the house of the Lord, that has like a twofold. That is first the temple as well as all of those that serve within it. And because of this, they have set a tax upon themselves of one-third of a shekel tax that they take every year that will support the Levites, the priests, the poor, and the homeless. In addition to this, they have decided to draw lots, and they are going to bring wood into the temple for the sacrifices. We are blessed in this country. We have more than we need. As we've seen with Israel, if we're not really careful, we will allow this blessing that God has given us to turn us against God. Uh, it can be very dangerous if we're not really careful and not willing to sit back and, and to look into it, uh, to spend time with God, to seek his direction and his guidance. When I think of tithing, um, you know, the New Testament really doesn't tell us that you have to do 10% or 20%. What I think is if you have much or if you have little, Simply find a way to invest it in God's kingdom. Let God do with it what he will. Matthew 6.33 comes to mind. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all things will be added to you. So a question again. I'm full of questions. That's the way I teach at work. What would a personal covenant look like if you were to do one for yourself? And what would a covenant look like if you were to do one for Burr Oak? And then ask yourself, who's going to hold me accountable and what effect would it have on the community? I always look to try to see Christ um, when I'm in the gospel. And the Old Testament sometimes for me is really hard to find Christ. I have read over this several times and there are several directions that I could use. But as I look at this, the first thing that caught my attention was chapter 10. And all of these names that are on the covenant, all 84 of them. And I'm reminded that there's a greater covenant for all of us that know Christ who made a sacrifice. And now our names are on his list. Uh, we will have eternal life. The day Christ died for all who would believe in his death and resurrection. I see forgiveness and restoration in the work of Jesus Christ. Shall we pray? God, I thank you for this time that you've given me. I thank you for those that have come to church today. I thank you for the truths that come out of this Bible, your word. I thank you for the illustration of community and how we can make it work for us today. We can pull this out of the Old Testament, but we can still use it. We can set things up. We can look back. We can see where we have walked away. We can see where we've been pulled away. We can find a spot of where maybe it just slowly happened and we become quite complacent and we're comfortable with where we're at. So us as, for we as a church, the Baroque board, work on our hearts as you did with Israel. Bring us around to the point to where we're really to take it, we're ready to take action, to move out, to allow you to provide and to build upon what you would have us do. Please be with us and guide us in this next week. In Christ's name I pray, amen. Will you pray with me? Most gracious and glorious God, you are an awesome God. You are omnipotent, omnipresent. You are all powerful and everywhere all at once. In this place, Lord, we come to praise your holy name, to offer you our offerings 
and pray that you accept them as we bring them this day. We ask you to put your blessing upon them that they may increase and bring your saving grace to the world and, this, and, and around this community. Father God, you are so gracious. You provide us with all that we need before we ask. And we ask you now, Lord, to forgive us our sinful ways. We are poor sinful beings, and Lord, we are, but we are heartily sorry of them and do repent of them. And ask you to not look upon us with anger, but deliver us from, from your wrath and forgive us for the many ways that we come short of your glory in our life. Father, it is by your grace alone we live and move and have our being. You hold all things together in the palm of your hand. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Father, as we look, look at the condition this world is in, the hostilities and, and anger and, and bloodshed that is even now happening, we wonder, we wonder why. Father, your people in Israel have been oppressed and, and, and held in bondage for years. And we, we think and we, we remember that our Lord and Savior comes from that heritage. And he has washed us clean of our sins by his shed blood. And we who have accepted him as Lord and Savior, Father, are grafted into that heritage of the Jewish people. And Father, we do, we do grieve for them. We pray your, your blessings on them, your protection your guidance. Most of all, Father, we pray for a solution to this. Even as our Lord may be the only solution when he comes back. Father, we continue to pray for the ministries here of Burr Oak, We pray, for, we pray for your people to see the importance of attending church, to continue to look to you for praise, for, for the needs that we have. We continue to pray for our missionaries that we support, for Miracle Tree, Inspiration Ministries, Noble House, LifeWise Academy. And Father, we pray for our students in schools around uh, in, in, in our school here at Central Noble. But also for, for students of every community. Father, in this uncertain world, our society seems to be more fractured than ever. Guide, and guide us into the ways that you would have us go. And we pray for our neighbor, neighboring churches, Father, that, that their efforts would be blessed, that their vision and outreach may be according to your will. We pray for Burr Oaks' vision and outreach be according to your will. Guide and protect us this week. Show us the doors that you would have us go through. And we will give you all the praise. In your son's name I pray. 
Amen. I'm going to have you stand. Come and rejoice, we will rejoice and be glad in 